So to my left is Henry Cornell. He's founder of Cornell Capital, which is a private investment firm that oversees 2.5 billion in capital. Um, to his left, is it? Yes, to his left is Chin Chu. Chin is founder of CC Capital, a private investment firm as well that he founded in 2016 after spending 25 years at Blackstone. And Elisa Wood. Elisa is a partner at KKR. She's been there for 16 years building several bu business lines and right now is head of Private Markets Products Group, if that's right. So why don't we take a minute, Henry, and if you wouldn't mind starting, if I, you wouldn't mind if I start with you, your, your firm, if you could give us a little bit of an overview of how you actually go about deploying capital. Uh, interesting question. I, th I think our firm is composed of 22 people. We have a Hong Kong office and a New York office, and the people who are the senior folks in the firm I've worked with throughout my career. And having done a number of transactions in the last 35 years, along with the rest of the partners, we've met lots of CEOs, we've sat on lots of boards, and the first point of entry, so to speak, is talking to your old contacts seeing what's going on in the respective industries we're focusing on and relentless pursuit of ideas. Because deal flow is the lifeblood of the business and if you're just receiving books from prominent Wall Street firms, you're not creating and creating a strong point of view. So we, we tend to go out and hit the street pretty hard. Jin, what about you? How would you describe about, about how your firm goes about deploying capital? Just to give us a little sense of where you fit in this space. I agree with Henry. I think the key is to create your deals and we like to create proprietary transactions or deals where we have an angle. I think it is very important to be proactive, right? relying on your industry contact, your knowledge base, and your creativity. Creativity in finance is very important to put deals together. We tend to target deals that have longer term horizons. We like to think of deals not in the private equity context of four to five years, but is this a business you can own for a decade? Is this a business you can compound for 15, 20 years? Not per se permanent capital, but long-term capital. We're also very conscious of where we are in the environment. I think today we're in a frothy period of environment. So how would this deal do in a recession? How would this deal do in a downturn? Does it have the resiliency that you can continue to compound the value? And I think we look at uh, deals that have moats or uh, barriers to entry that would weather a downturn and it has winds at the back. So those are the things we look for. And as I said, to create proprietary deals is very important. Lisa, how about you? How do you go about being a part of a big firm like KKR? How do you go about deploying capital in your role? Sure. I, I think the one common element that we're all saying is it's a relationship business, right? So what we strive to be is a partner of choice, whether it be a family, a CEO, a management team, um, an entrepreneur. The capital that we're investing is an outgrowth of that relationship. So what we try to do is, is poise ourselves to be able to invest up and down the capital structure across industries and around the world. We manage about $200 billion of capital. And we're not trying to be all things to all people, but we are trying to bring investment advice uh, in those specific situations where we believe we can be that trusted partner. Um, and that for us is really what it comes down to. It's a people business. We're investing behind people. We try to take local champions, grow them, grow them globally, and make them better. So the question du jour, it feels like, for everyone is either when, are, when do you think we'll have the next recession, recession or where are we in the cycle? So I guess I'll ask you that. Where do you think we are in the cycle, Henry? Well, uh, people a lot smarter than me have said it's the seventh inning. Some people think it's the tenth inning. Uh, it's, it's a little bit, um, you know, how you're feeling about the world. I, I will tell you, we are on planes every week talking to CEOs, talking to companies, and in my life. I'm 62. I've been doing this for 35 years. I have never seen the U.S. economy this strong. It is across the board, almost in every industry, performing brilliantly. The need for labor is substantive. You know, it's very hard for the companies that we own to find talented labor. You now have extraneous political events that are eroding confidence. Frankly, the media loves to jump on this idea as well. And that is a concern of mine, not the basic supply and demand of goods and services, but how people are feeling in the confidence level. 
So you've got a big midterm election coming up that's going to change things one way or the other. You've got a situation between China and the states and a trade war, which frankly feels like it'll get worse before it gets better. So you do have a lot of things happening out there that could erode confidence. But I think our Fed chairman, with all due respect to the president, is fantastic and knows what he's doing. And I have great confidence that the backbone of the U.S. economy will do well for quite some time. And by that, you mean in terms of the pace at which we're expecting the rates to rise? I, I think the rate rise is fine, as is. I think the Fed is smart enough to know how to pivot if need be. And I, I think they still have tools at their disposal. And I, I, again, the underlying economy can handle this. So you've got a nice balance of rates so people who save can be rewarded again. You know, the fact that wages are going up is good. Yay for America. You know, you want people to do better. And so I, I think all of this can create more confidence. But, you know, right now it's an interesting media moment and it's an interesting political moment. I agree with Henry that the economy fundamentally is very strong. In my various conversations, everybody echoes that sentiment. From the earnings growth to even consumer confidence is very strong. There's a bifurcation, however, in that the valuation reflected in the market, some of the sectors or the vast majority of the sectors are quite expensive. You have very inflated prices. The prices paid for deals in private equity continues to creep up. The average multiple over the last year is now up to 11 times EBITDA. That's close to the levels that were paid back in 07, 08, before the last market crash at 12 times EBITDA. So we have to be very careful in terms of valuation of what's being paid. The average debt multiple today is six times, pretty close to the last time uh, also. So what we are doing today as investors, we have to navigate in this tough environment with the consumer confidence in investing in companies that can withstand if there is a downturn, whether it's the ninth or tenth inning of the economy. And what we do is we try to buy companies in that mold. So we recently announced the Dun & Bradstreet deal, a $7 billion deal. What we like about that company, for instance, is that in the last recession, it went down 4%. It has that diversity of customer base, it has resiliencies, and it has win its back, and has a lot of free cash flow. And I think those are the kind of investments that we target that has a lot of downside protection, but significant upside as well with the cost and growth opportunities of a company such as Dun & Bradstreet. Lisa, what, what about you? I think because KKR invests around the world, we don't look at things just from a domestic lens. So I think on, on a domestic side, we are sitting here saying we know the music is going to stop at some point. Um, it's not going to be a perfect science. I think we're probably a little more bearish than market consensus is. So if we had to predict it, we think we're sooner to that end than, than further away. Um, but that being said, we also invest capital around the world. And when, when you think about Europe, for instance, Europe's actually a couple years behind where the U.S. is in its recovery. When you look around the world for valuations, yes, the U.S. looks pretty expensive, but the emerging markets have actually been down about 20, a little over 20% year over year. So we actually think there are pockets that are very interesting today that are not, uh, um, I would say, as bearish or as is in terms of where valuations are, are we investing at different peaks? Are we putting peak levels on the different businesses we're buying? You know, I think it really depends on where you're sitting. Private equity is a very, an alternative, I think it's a very local business. So depending where you're sitting, I think you have a very different lens. Henry, I should bring you in here on the, the point of the international scope. You've been in, in looking at investments in one way or another in Asia, particularly for decades. What's your take right now on opportunities there? Your firm has offices in Hong Kong, for example, an office in Hong Kong, for example. Oh, I was fortunate to start my time in the Asia trade in 88, and I've been involved uh, since then. I think what we're set up to do right now is we're fundamentally a North American firm with a core competency in Asia. So having been lucky, lucky to be there when Mao suits went to blue suits and bicycles went to cars, uh, we have a lot of relationships in the region, and we're able to capitalize on those. But for example, we bought um, Pyrex, Corel Brands, and 30% of the revenues are in Asia. And so we use our Hong Kong presence to help them grow in the region dramatically. 
In China itself, we're very involved in healthcare. The woman that runs Asia in our firm was the CFO of Mindray, which is the largest Chinese medical equipment company. And the macro of healthcare in China requires a lot of capital and innovation over the next few years. So we're looking in that space in China. But right now, we're at the position where we're really trying to help American firms go to China. And that can be interesting on many levels. Lisa, I don't know if you want to jump in here, but actually one of the things we talked about in preparation for this panel was the other route, going local in China, places like mm -hmm. China, and then trying to help them go global. Yeah, so we, we actually do a lot of that around the world. Um, we do that um, a lot in Asia, and we also do it a lot in Europe. And what we try to do is invest in local champions, right? We, we believe in a very localized market. We have 21 offices around the world. Um, we're in every major economy um, across um, Asia, for instance. And I think what we've really tried to do is in some cases take Western best practices and really invest behind a local champion. So what, what does that mean? It means that food safety has been a big area that we've put a lot of capital to work. Um, investing behind um, dairy, chicken, pork. When you think about the rising middle class and what they're going to need to do, they need to eat more protein. It's a pretty basic concept, right? And they also want safe food that their children aren't going to die from eating. Um, so we've been investing behind that. We've been investing behind the millennial trends. So if, for instance, you're looking at some businesses um, in, in China right now, there are 330 um, billion millennials in China. That compares to 66 billion in the U.S. And if you look at the trends you're seeing um, in the market, how they spend their how they spend their money, how they um, they like experiences over things, you can take some of the best practices that you've seen in the West and really apply that to these local markets. I think the other thing we're seeing is this trend of cross-border trade, right? And I, and I think in we've seen whether it be across you know the Europe to Asia or even pan pan Asia we've seen there to be um, a lot of really interesting deals to be done so for instance um, a deal that we a corporate carve out we did out of um, Japan Calsonic we actually just merged it with the division of Fiat we announced that on Monday um, and that cross-border um, uh, deal has now allowed that company it's an auto parts company to be a number seven in the world and I think those are some of the interesting taking the local Local champions and building them into really interesting global businesses. Jin, you mentioned earlier the fact of trade and what's happening with that right now in terms of how you're looking at the world and where it may go. What do you think might, how are you trying to manage these trade wars in terms of how you approach investing right now? We are mostly focused in North America. But having said that, every company we invest in has a global presence, so we still have to understand how trade factors into that, how the various political risk factors into that. I think with regards to trade and uh, trade wars, it is very complicated for us to predict. So we try to avoid right now uh, things that will be effectively uh, uh, affected in, uh, impactfully by the trade or trade wars. Feels like almost everything, though, would be somewhat impacted. What do you think, Henry, in terms of in Asia in particular? I think it's impactful. Um, <laughs> You know, look, the uh, legitimacy of the U.S. position or the response from China that, you know, there's, there's arguments on both sides. Uh, one could question the tone and substance of where we are in this conversation. Fundamentally, I believe the states in China are married. And like any marriage, sometimes someone sleeps on the couch. Um, <laughs> and I'm hopeful that they actually... Uh, get in a room and cut something that works for both countries sooner than later because, you know, two or three weeks ago you saw a U.S. Navy vessel and a Chinese Navy vessel miss each other by a few feet. And uh, the last thing we need is a reinterpretation of the Archduke in 1914. So, you know, it's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about because I do think the impacts far away can really resonate here at home. In terms of private capital, we've talked a little bit about already the high valuations, but when you move away from thinking about investing from a geographic point of view um, in Asia or places like that to a sector point of view, where are some of the places where you actually think there might still be some opportunities? We've seen a ton of money go into real estate. I literally have some readers email me after we do some stories about new funds that are coming out raising money for real estate or energy, and they say, oh my gosh, where are they going to put all that money um, once they get it? I think you try to gravitate toward 
high quality businesses, market leaders, and to repeat myself, industries that can withstand a recession. Uh, we are all paying full prices for companies right now. So you'd rather pay full prices for a very, very high quality business that if you are behind your projections because of something that happens in a trade war, economic recession, you can recover. And I think that's very important to gravitate toward high quality business at this time. And I think along with that are high quality management teams that you want to pair up with high quality businesses. You mentioned also before that you look for companies that have a moat. To you in your brain, what does that mean? I think a moat is a competitive advantage that is not, uh, is impeachable, unimpeachable. Uh, a barrier to entry that cannot be broken down by one or two years or with price wars. Companies uh, seem, every company um, would uh, indicate they have a moat. <coughs> But in my experience, 5 to 10% of the companies out there really have a moat, whether it's a data advantage, whether it's a software advantage, whether it's a technology advantage, whether it's a network advantage. Those are things that you want to look for. If it's not a, it's not a commodity product, it's not replicated in one or two years, these are the things that we look for. So for example, our company at Dun & Bradstreet, we, our database is 30,000 different databases, where a third of those are proprietary databases. So it's not easily uh, replicated, and that's a moat that we think is important. We also have a 60% market share in our main market, so the network effect and the power and the brand name are very important as well. I think you actually said something interesting before when you think about real assets, right? Um, private capital spans a lot of different parts uh, or a lot of different strategies and asset classes, right? It's private equity. Private equity is probably one of the biggest parts of it, but there's real estate. There's real assets, energy, infrastructure, and then there's private credit, right? Um, so when you look across all of that, I think there are a lot of pockets where there are voids in the market, and private capital has to be the answer to some of those. You know, so if you look at private private credit, for instance, banks stop lending, right? The asset-backed financing, NPLs, they're huge opportunities that private capital is the only answer. Um, because the banks are not competing there anymore, coming out of the crisis. If you look at infrastructure, for instance, if you're just assuming base levels of GDP growth over the next, call it, 15 years, there are going to be trillions of dollars that are needed um, for economies all over the world to sustain the, the, the growth that we're going, we expect to see. If you think about energy right now, um, all of the major energy firms globally are trying to restructure their balance sheets and trying to be more competitive for Wall Street. So one of the things that they're seeing right now, if you talk to some of the big energy majors, is they're not being valued on the street for having stable cash flows, right? Assets that are producing assets are not as, quote unquote, sexy as some of the hot shell plays. So what are they doing? They're selling those developed producing assets that are very nice cash generating businesses, and they're reinvesting it for what the street is valuing. So all all of those are areas that, at least from where we sit today, we don't see valuations um, under siege um, in terms of the ca trying to put capital to work and valuations to be really high. There are deals to be done, and there are not a lot of people who can do them. So I think for, for KKR, we, we try to, I think honestly, skate to where the puck's going, and not it's a Wayne Gretzky quote, not skate to where the puck is. And where we think the puck is going are these areas where capital is just not as readily available. In terms of sectors, Henry, what are you thinking could offer some opportunities out there? I'll get to the areas you think are, you should stay away from, but we'll stay positive for a minute. Well, the areas we focus on are consumer industrial, so Pyrex. I think I have my mother's Pyrex. I'm sure everyone I'm on the, you know, everyone has Pyrex. Great consumer recognition. I think to Chin's point, there's a little bit of a moat, um, but you always worry in consumer products, you got to keep the brands exciting with new shapes and sizes, but we like consumer industrial, and there are many opportunities um, to consolidate in that sector. Uh, we like financials. We uh, bought the Talcott Insurance Company from the Hartford, and we think there's an opportunity to do a lot more in the variable annuity business. Uh, it's one that's pretty technical, but it's one that we've had a lot of experience in. And we also like energy. Um, we invested in a new carbon black technology that its byproduct is hydrogen, not CO2, so it also has a carbon footprint that's amazing, and it 
arbitrage as natural gas versus oil with a new furnace technology. So sometimes you have to do green fields with guys who know what they're doing, and this is a group of MIT brainiacs who put this thing together. And you know, those are the areas we focused on. What about areas that you see some warning signs developing? Any out there you would point to? Well, I, I take the point that everyone's looking at. Anything when you're paying double-digit multiples, even though the plentiful nature of cheap debt with no covenants is attractive, the underlying growth required for that falls apart if you get any sort of recession. So I think um, you can pick points, you know, high-end New York condos, you may have some opportunities in the next year or two. But I think it's the valuation issue that the three of us are really all concerned about. And I think, frankly, on the phone, in the audience, you know, prices are high. So you really need to know what you're doing. You need to have a backup strategy and understand that the thought of acquisition where you're going to arbitrage, you know, buying companies cheaper than the platform doesn't always work out because you wake up the market when you buy something and everyone wants that same price. You, men you mentioned high quality management teams. What do you look for in terms of high quality? We look for what the, the term that we use are, is a water walker, uh, somebody who's had multiple successes across different platforms, somebody who's able to wring out the efficiencies of the company, but more importantly, to reinvigorate revenue growth by new products, uh, by cross selling by just uh, changing the culture of the company. And those are hard to find, uh, as you know. There's a good management team or a great management team will help you endure um, uh, a recession, and an economic boom can really um, uh, advance uh, the, the uh, accelerate the value creation. You know, I think for KKR, we're, I think I would agree with everything that was said uh, by both of my panelists here. We look for best in class managers um, and we try to give them the resources that they need to, to do better, right, and to grow their companies. We focus on growth. That is something, whether it's a buyout deal, whether it's a minority growth equity investment, whether it's an infrastructure deal, whether it's an e buying an energy asset, we, we focus on growth and we focus on operations. And we think that when buying these businesses, it, it's, all, it's all local to some degree. So now, where are we seeing more interesting opportunities or less interesting opportunities? Every time I've said we don't like a certain industry, we don't like a specific part of a sector, we wind up doing a, a deal a couple weeks later. So <laughs> I, I'm a little nervous to, to say we don't like certain things. But I think there are characteristics, whether it be characteristics of certain managers and management teams or characteristics of certain types of businesses, that it's, for us, it's an assessment of risk, right? When, when we're thinking of buying a company or investing a dollar, we're looking at the risk associated with that investment and with that dollar of capital. And no two dollars are the same, right? So investing in a, an emerging market versus investing in the US, there are different risks associated with that. And you need to price those risks into what we're doing. And having a good manager is a big piece of that risk. There are geopolitical risks, there are currency risks, there's trade risk. Um, and I think that's really the approach we take to investing, regardless of the strategy and regardless of the sector, is how do we price the risk? Can you ring fence the risk? Can you hedge the risk? And do you have very good people on the ground to execute against your vision? And if the answer in some combination is no to all of those things, that's a deal killer for us. Henry, I want to change gears for a moment here and talk a little bit about the rise of co-investing. This seems to have become more and more po popular over the last few years at big and small firms across the spectrum of private capital. You do a lot of co-investing at your firm. How, tell me about how that's changed how people deploy capital. Well, I think for us in particular, having come from a big firm where I had a very large pocketbook, I wanted to duplicate that in my new life and the investor base that we have are folks that I've known for decades. And they were very, they're sophisticated global investors and they can put their money anywhere and they were kind enough to support us. From the investor's point of view, they want to lower the costs of doing business. And so by giving them free co-invest and while they're in the fund, it allows you, at least allows us, to punch above our weight. You know, maybe not as big as my friends at KKR, but 
we can still play seriously in the, in the mid to upper market. And it helps my partners lower their costs of doing business. So we promised our investors at least one to one in everything we do, and we are more than exceeding that right now. And we love the partnership. So you know, we curated our investor base, so to speak. So we have roughly 20 people uh, who we call upon for advice. Because when you think about the sophisticated LPs, they're in the market every day. They're supporting Blackstone, KKR, others. They've got extraordinary amounts of information and market knowledge. And by having a smaller investor base who are very committed to you, before we make an investment, we call them. And what do you think of this widget company? And one of my favorite fellows will run to his file cabinet because it's still all in paper. And it comes back and he says, you know what? XYZ bought this in 99. They screwed it up in 02. This guy bought it in 05. And you know, that wealth of history can help us be smarter and avoid mistakes. So for us, co-investment is not just um, helping my investors lower their costs. It's helping us be better investors. I mean, listen, I, I think KKR, clearly, we agree with that. I agree with that. I think the having the ability to, I think, really consolidate and not have your competitors in your deals is helpful, right? Um, I think when you look back to SunGuard, which might be the prime deal that a lot of us point to, where we had seven sponsors in that deal, you know, it was who's leading. It was kind of like that, right? So it, in terms of that example, I think many of us walked away saying, we're never going to do that again. And there's a difference between bringing a partner into a deal, another sponsor, where they have some competitive angle, um, or there's, there's a piece of the puzzle in getting that deal done that you don't have on your own. And that's, that's OK. That there's value in that. I think capital for capital's sake is the piece that is, is less exciting, right? So um, in terms of what we've done, we went out in 2006, 2007, 2008, and we built a capital markets business. And we're not trying to disintermediate the street, but what we really tried to do is figure out sources of capital to meet our ideas. And how do you bridge that? And I think exactly what you said is, is how you do it. You build really deep relationships with a number of partners. And in, in order to be good partners to them, you're bringing them in earlier into a transaction. It allows you to de-risk. It allows you not to have as many people at the table so you can get things done faster. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we're seeing that be the new model the industry and a lot of it is because that's what our investors are also demanding on the other side of the table right that's what they're expecting and being a good partner that's how they're defining it so regardless of I think the size you are in the market we're seeing the same playbook actually come to pass I think there are several trends in investing today for the LPs uh, certainly co-investment is a trend that will continue and I agree with everybody uh, here on the panel so I won't repeat it I think the other trends are having direct uh, deal access and making a decision for the LPs on that one deal instead of a blind pool fund. I think that will increase uh, over time, and I think it's a good trend. I think longer term capital, LPs like to have the capital compound over more than four or five years over a longer period of time, and I think that trend will persist. And now alternative formations of capital, including SPACs, uh, SPACs today represent about 20% of the market consistently for the last three years and 20% of the IPO market. And there's over $30 billion of SPACs that have been issued in the last four or five years. We've issued two SPACs and sponsored two SPACs. One is CF Corp and the second one, Collier Creek. I think that's an alternative form of capital that per se does not compete with private equity, but provides alternatives for companies to go public instead of the traditional way. So I think those are the four trends that I see, including co-investment in the LP community. And just on that point, Shin, with this SPAC trend, what is it that's attractive about that as it's gaining more momentum? Uh, SPACs used to be a four-letter word, but today <laughs> it's being more accepted because there are large private equity firms, including TPG, Carlisle, we did one two and a half years ago, so you have higher quality sponsors. I think that's the first part of it. You now have higher quality investors. In our last back, we had at the top of our list very traditional institutional investors, not the hedge funds at the top of the list. So the fundamental guys are now into the SPAC market. 
you have the sellers now, including people like Blasto, selling companies since it's back, Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 100 companies. So I think the whole SPAC market has changed. And what has happened now is a legitimate, legitimate product for companies to go public other than the traditional way. When you go public through a SPAC, you often can get more proceeds compared to an IPO. There's a certain price that you can attain instead of going for the vagaries of how's the market doing this week and can I get out this week. And I think there's a rollover element as well. If a company or family wants to sell to a SPAC or a private equity firm selling it to a SPAC, they can roll over as well. So for all of those elements, but especially the first few points, which is now high quality sponsors, sellers and investors, I think SPAC market is more of a permanent uh, form of an uh, asset class. And we're certainly seeing to the other trend, one of the other trends you mentioned, longer term capital, funds that are opening to hold capital a lot longer. How do you think that will change things? Frankly, I think it's a great, a great trend in the market because you know there are ups and downs and having a longer term perspective allows you to fix things if they go wrong. I would say that some of the most fun I've had in my career are investments I've owned for 10 or 15 years, to Chin's point, where they're compounding nicely. And in our current um, mode, uh, we have the flexibility to go very long term. And I think that trend's a good one because this need to rotate capital or sell quickly only puts more onus on the providers because they have to redeploy it. So having something that's working and compounding is a really nice thing. I think your lens is different if you look at longer term capital. Not every company owned by private equity fits into that bucket. So you cl you, your aperture is different, but when you can buy a company, invest in a company longer term compounding, it's great for the LP and it's great for the GP because your business plan is different as opposed to trying to exit in three or four or five years the traditional route. We only have a couple minutes left, but I wanted to ask a question of you all. What do you think, how do you think deploying capital will look like, what do you think it will look like in 2019? Will it be harder or easier to deploy capital in 2019? It's been hard since the Reagan administration. <laughs> I mean, it, it just, it's, uh, it's always hard because you have to deal with the market at the time. I think the fact that, you know, and everyone reads the same newspapers that, you know, we all read, there is a lot of dry powder. There's probably more capital flowing through the industry than ever before. The debt providers are very happy to provide the debt, but you know prices are high, but then costs can be low. I, I just think, as we've been discussing, you have political elements now that make deploying capital. You need to be really thoughtful about what that can do, what the unintended consequences are. So to me, it, you know, it's hard now. It was hard in 1988. It was hard in 2000. So it's. It's always presenting an issue. I don't, if it was easy, everyone would do it. You know? <laughs> I agree with that. I think it, uh, $660 billion of dry powder today. It will remain very, very tough if the market um, corrects. I think there are other issues that goes along with it, whether it's a consumer confidence issue or is the economy cracking. So you face that dilemma. If the market continues to go up, uh, there will be other issues with that. So I think it's about the same. I think from my perspective, in markets where there are dislocations, in markets that are hard, however you define hard, that's typically when some of the best deals are done, right? So I think we're really looking forward to whether it's 19 or 20 or whatever year it may be, for there to be some crack in the system. Um, if you look at the last week, for instance, and the volatility in the markets, that's what excites us, right? It's not when all things are growing to the sky. It's when there are some pockets where you feel the earth shake a little bit and you have to have the conviction of your investment thesis and the management team you're investing behind and really lean in. Um, so I think for us, it, I agree, it's, it's always been hard. It will be hard. There is a lot of dry powder on the sidelines, but if you actually look at it in a relative term, um, or in relative terms, look at, look at private capital and the deals that are being done as a percentage of M&A activity or as a pe percentage of deals being done in the market. In 2007, um, those deals were about 15% of what was getting done in the market. Today, it's under five. And I think that actually speaks to the growth of the market and, and the opportunity set that has really just expanded. And maybe that's because things have doing deals in Asia and doing deals in parts of the world that 20 years ago um, are a lot easier to do today or more accepted to do today. But I think there's a lot of opportunity regardless of how hard it is.